Welcome to Dedham TV's presentation of Why Facts Don't Change Our Minds with Melanie Tresick King. Melanie is the creator of thinkingispower.com, an online resource that provides critical thinking education to the general public. She is currently an associate professor of biology at Massasoit Community College, where she teaches a general education science course designed to equip students with critical thinking, information literacy, and science literacy skills. An active speaker and consultant, Melanie loves to share her teach skills, not facts approach with other science educators and help schools and organizations meet their goals through better thinking. She is also the education director for the Mental Immunity Project, which aims to advance and apply the science of mental immunity to inoculate minds against misinformation. Melanie Tresick King. Thank you, Brian. I'm so happy to be here. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, the images should make sense here shortly, but I'm gonna start by telling you a story and then come back to the story at the end. So in the spring of 1954, Dorothy Martin, uh, who is a psychic who lived outside of Chicago, woke suddenly and she was receiving a message that she had to write down. So her medium was automatic handwriting. The messages would flow through her and she would write. And the message she was receiving wasn't her handwriting, it wasn't her words. And she realized it was from Sananda, or Jesus, living on the planet Clarion. So Sananda told Dorothy to gather other seekers uh, to meet regularly, to hear their prophecies and spread their message uh, so that others might follow the guardians as well. So on July 23rd, the guardians sent Dorothy a message to meet them. They would arrive in their flying saucer on an air force base outside of town. So they were very excited to meet Jesus and the other uh, guardians. They spent all afternoon there, no flying saucer. Uh, there was a man they noticed alongside the road. Uh, he seemed lost. Uh, he refused food or drink. It was kind of strange to them. But later that afternoon, Dorothy got a message that that actually had been Sanana or Jesus in disguise. And they were very excited that they had actually seen Jesus. So in August, she got a really dire message that the earth was going to be destroyed by a flood on December 21st. And that the guardians would come rescue the seekers. The story got picked up in a local newspaper. And um, this is Charles Lawhead, here's Dorothy Martin. Charles Lawhead was a professor at the local college. Uh, he was one of her biggest followers. So. The message got, the end of day's cult got put into the uh, local paper. Leon Festinger was a psychologist at the time and he was reading his Sunday morning newspaper and he came across this. And he thought, I wonder what will happen on December 22nd when the world didn't end. So he and his fellow psychologists and his graduate students uh, infiltrated the group and followed them for the whole summer and fall into December to see what would happen. Okay, now we're gonna come back to that for the rest of the story later, but I want you to notice maybe where we're going in terms of uh, will they change their minds. So let's start first with um, what we believe and why. So the word belief has lots of different meanings, but basically it's something that you accept as true. It doesn't have to be true, but if you think it's true, then it's one of your beliefs. Our beliefs impact the decisions that we make. We act on our beliefs, whether they're true or not. Uh, but we come to our beliefs in a variety of ways, primarily two. The first is our personal experiences. So um, we actually really trust our personal experiences as a way of knowing. And I spend a lot of time teaching my students about why they might not necessarily uh, trust their experiences. Let me give you an example. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I think I must have been about five, uh, I saw a ghost. So my grandma was staying over at the time and she was sleeping in the bed next to me. And I woke to, um, like, I felt like a fingernail moving up my arm, just really slowly like this. And I looked up and there was an old woman. She had like straggly gray hair. 
And I tried to wake my grandma to tell her that, you know, there was a ghost and I was really scared. And I couldn't. I couldn't wake up. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I felt like I was saying something, but I don't, I don't think I was. I felt like she was holding me down and um, even preventing me from breathing. Now, I know now what that experience was. I don't know if any of you are familiar. Um, this is, yeah, what do you think it is? Sleep paralysis. Yeah. Do you experience it too? Only once. It's terrifying, isn't it? Yeah, it's terrifying. So sleep paralysis, when you're, when you're sleeping, um, your brain shuts off the uh, n impulses from your nerves to your muscles. You don't want to act out what's happening in your dreams. That could be dangerous. So sleep paralysis is that period of time where if your brain is awake, but that the nerves haven't turned back on, so your brain thinks, I should be able to control what's happening, but you can't. And um, people around the world for millennia have been experiencing this. We have evidence of like um, the uh, pictures of demons holding people down while they sleep. Here's the thing, it is terrifying. And our brains try to explain what's happening and they use what it knows. Now my five-year-old brain knew, um, honestly, when I picture the person holding me down now, it's literally the witch from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Because that was the scariest thing my five-year-old brain could come up with. Uh, other people explain it with aliens or with um, uh, ghosts, whatever it is. But here's the thing. That personal experience was really real to me. And I was convinced that that was a ghost. We think that if we saw it, if it happened to us, then we know it's true. Like, I tried homeopathy and it worked. That's how I know it works. But homeopathy literally can't work. There's nothing in it. So why would we think it works? Well, we can have a placebo effect, confirmation bias. There's all kinds of mental errors that can go astray. The point is, we think that I saw it or it happened to me means that it's real. So our personal experiences are the first way that we come to know things. Now, our personal experiences don't always lead us astray, but they can. The other thing is from other people that we trust, our received wisdom. So this could be uh, our family, uh, it could be trusted authority figures, like maybe um, religious leaders or even politicians. It could be our culture. Uh, so we tend to adopt the beliefs of people around us. If you look at a map of global world religions, they're, it's not an accident that they're all clustered together. We take on the beliefs of people we trust. In particular, um, we're, we're a tribal species. So humans evolved um, in small groups, uh, most of our history uh, was, ex was spent in these small groups where we knew everyone in our group. There were small groups, we trusted them, we relied on them for survival. Um, and being able to trust that group to protect us from the other groups was really important. So we trust them, we trust people around us. The problem is that our Tri our tribes aren't small anymore. Like, we don't live in that environment. We live online in a population of 8 billion people. And so our tribes today look very different. They could be things like um, uh, religion or it could be political ideologies. It could be something really simple um, like, uh, so I travel a lot and when I run into an American abroad, it's like, oh, hey, one of my people. And that's literally the only thing I probably have in common with them. So. We form tribes based around identity. But when it all comes down to it, our beliefs are based on trust. So we like to think of ourselves as, a, um, as rational. We come to our beliefs by following evidence to a conclusion. When actually, most of the time, we come to our beliefs through these sort of illogical ways, through an experience or somebody we trust telling us something, and then it just becomes part of our belief system. So um, I've, you may have heard the term um, post-truth, that gets thrown around a lot these days. And um, I actually, I, I don't think that that's true. I think most of us actually care about what's true or not. I would argue that we're more in a post-trust world where what we do is rely on people that we trust, but those people may not necessarily be the most reliable source of information. So we come to our beliefs in a variety of ways, but they're not necessarily rational ways. 
And then the beliefs that we have form a web. This is um, the Willard van uh, Ormijn Quine, uh, who formed this idea of the, the web of beliefs. If you think about the, the center of that being your core beliefs, it's the foundational things, um, values, uh, things that you um, hold as absolutely true. And then work outward from there. And each of those nodes are connecting other beliefs. So you hear new information coming in. It has to fit. It has to be consistent with that. If it's not, we either reject it or we find a way to fit it in with our, what's already there. And not all of our beliefs are the same. So um, I, I'm broadly grouping beliefs here by whether they're evidence-based or whether they're not. And one of the ways of knowing the difference is, can I prove it wrong? So this concept of falsifiability um, uh, was originally Karl Popper. Uh, it's an important characteristic of science. Just because a belief is unfalsifiable doesn't mean that it's not true. And it doesn't mean that it's not important. But it does mean that it's not evidence-based. So let me give you some examples of things that aren't falsifiable. Um, <laughs> Brian already suggested this. Um, I hold that kittens are cuter than puppies. And actually cats make better pets than dogs. Okay, now I have reasons why I think that's true, right? I could say um, I was gone for a couple of days. He was fine by himself. He's self-cleaning, uh, he's quiet, right? He's cuddly and lovey and playful and then I can leave him alone. I could give you reasons to justify that belief, but that belief's an opinion, right? It is inherently not something that's evidence-based, but notice what I did. If I really believe firmly in that particular opinion, which I do, by the way, um, no, dogs are great, don't get me wrong, I'm just not responsible enough for a dog. So um, if we really believe firmly in on these subjective beliefs, then we find evidence to support them. But the point is that it's not an evidence-based belief. If evidence can't disprove it, then any evidence in support of it doesn't really matter. So I need to recognize that that is in a subjective opinion and not use evidence. Vague beliefs or vague claims. Um, so like, let's say that um, a supplement says that it supports the immune system or it reduces fatigue or um, promotes overall health and well-being. Supplements by law are not allowed to make specific health claims. So what they do is they make these vague claims. The power of vague claims, though, is that we infuse our own beliefs into it. We, we get to interpret it the way that we want to. Horoscopes are a great example. Um, so I might say something like, um, uh, you have a need to be liked and admired by people. That's basically true of almost everyone, right? But we think, oh, wow, that is so me. Actually, he didn't say anything, okay? So vague beliefs aren't falsifiable. And then finally, supernatural beliefs. This could be anything from gods and ghosts, spirits, vague energies, like a lot of energy medicine is based on these vague supernatural claims. Um, so for example, I see a lot of people um, using a supernatural entity to support a belief. Like they may say something like, COVID was God's punishment for insert whatever. COVID is falsifiable, right? We can test for the presence of COVID. God punishing, we can't. Now again, it may be true, right? These are basically um, religious beliefs. They're, they're based on these supernatural claims. They may be true, but they're not evidence-based. So we just need to recognize that there's a difference between these different kinds of beliefs. I will say, importantly, that our um, unfalsifiable beliefs tend to be amongst the more important ones to us. And so we have a tendency to want to use evidence to support them. Uh, and so just know the difference that this is an unfalsifiable belief, but I'm still going to hold it because it matters to me for whatever reason it is. Okay. Moving on, um, we don't perceive reality the way that it is. Okay, what color is the dress? You've all seen the dress, right? This is the dress that broke the internet. What color is the dress? Blue. Blue. Anybody think that it's not blue? 
Yeah, Anthony and I, my, my husband and I have had lots of arguments over this because you see it as what? White. Do you? Do you also see it as white? Yeah. White and gold? White and gold. Or Right. Uh huh. So I love using this example because it's a dress, right? Who really cares what color it is? But to be in a room full of people where you're like, wait a minute, you see that as white and gold? How is that possible? Something must be wrong with you. Why do you see that as white and gold? Now there is a reality. The dress actually is blue and black. Thank you very much. Um, but what's happening is your brain is making assumptions about the lighting of the color uh, the lighting, the dress, the, the picture was taken in. Um, if your assumptions are different, you see something different. But seriously, this is the color of a dress and we're seeing it differently. Now imagine something more important than the color of a dress and how we might perceive those things differently and be so convinced that we're right and cannot figure out why someone else sees something differently. Now again, there is an objective reality out there. I love this image because even if we see reality as it is, we only see part of it. This is why diversity matters. There's a diversity of perspectives that provide us with different testable hypotheses. So listening to those different perspectives can help us see the bigger picture. There's a concept called naive realism, which is the idea that we, are, um, we think we see reality as it is. The problem is, and, and we're very convinced by it, right? So if you see this as white and gold and you're not around somebody who sees it as black and blue, then you would never question it. So having somebody else around who sees it differently can help. But now if you don't listen, if you just assume, for example, if people don't perceive things the same way, we think, um, well, they just don't have the same information that we have. So we just need to educate them with our facts. <coughs> Okay, that didn't work. They must be stupid. Uh, or maybe they're evil, right? Think about all the conversations that we have with people about important issues where they just may legitimately be perceiving something differently than the rest of us. Um, the important thing to do here is if somebody perceives something different, if somebody has a different perspective on something, the interesting question is why? Not, okay, well, you see it as that. Let me convince you why you're wrong. It's, you see it as that. Can you tell me why? What is happening? Why might you see that? Now let's explore this together. Okay. But there's a variety of things that can impact our perceptions. So, for example, we didn't start to see UFOs in the sky, really, the flying saucers, until about the late 40s and then early 50s, and then culture just sort of blew up with UFOs and aliens, and there's Roswell and movies and so on. Our culture is saturated with aliens and flying saucers. We take on the beliefs of people around us. People are seeing these things. Okay, that could be true. And then if I see something in the sky and I don't know what it is, my brain goes, I've been primed. It doesn't realize it's been primed, but I've been primed to see flying saucers. That's a flying saucer. We often say that um, seeing is believing, but actually believing can be seeing. We literally see what we, but the ghost, my ghost, I was seeing what I expected to see. And now put us online. The kinds of things that might be influencing our perceptions. Uh, this is a filter bubble um, where our feeds our social media feeds, our news feeds, um, even our Google search results can be different because we choose different things. Like if I'm on Facebook, I tell Facebook, I like this, I don't like this, I wanna follow this, that sort of thing. Facebook notices what I click on, how long I hover over something. And then the algorithms kick in and they give me more of what I want to see because the goal for them is to keep me on the platform. Okay, but if we're each online as a result of different choices and different algorithms and seeing vastly different things, the kinds of information that's informing our worldview all leads to something drastically different. So if your feed, if the information that you're seeing has given you a different view of reality, then we're not even on the same page. And even if we're seeing the same thing, we can come to different 
conclusions. This here is a, a Pew survey over time of um, people who lean right and left and their view of the economy, and they've put in their elections. Literally within a few weeks, if a Republican is elected, Democrats go, well, now the economy's in the tanker, and vice versa. The economy is complicated, right? It's big. It's difficult even to measure. But our perceptions of it, and we become so sure we're right, and then we're surrounded by other people telling us, you know what? You're right. The economy is in the tanker, and it's all because of them, and so on and so on. Have you ever watched a sporting event with someone who's rooting for a different team? Right? Rooting for a team changes what you see. It changes your view of reality. Back to our tribes. Right? We're all playing on different tribes right now, and we're rooting for these different teams. And it literally can change how we perceive um, news. Like people, uh, a Republican and a Democrat, can look at the same news story and see bias against their side. Right? So it colors our perception. Okay, So we're also emotional and biased, but we don't think we are. Um, there's a, um, if you imagine your brain, this concept comes from uh, Jonathan Haidt. Um, if you imagine your brain, an elephant and a rider. So the rider is on top of the elephant. The elephant is uh, always on. It's in control, right? It's hard to control an elephant. The elephant is emotional and it's biased and it's tribal and it's always on, always making decisions based on those assumptions and expectations and who we're rooting for and our emotions. And then the rider is capable of controlling the elephant, but it's hard work. So most of the time, what our rider does is the elephant suggests something to it and it goes, yeah, here's all the reasons why the elephant is right. Um, Brian, um, this is my lunch apparently. Um, <laughs> I love frosting. Uh, cake is a vehicle for frosting. Um, I will literally eat this whole thing in a certain setting if, I, if I'm allowed to. That's what my elephant wants to do, right? My elephant says, eat the frosting. Now my rider goes, that's how many calories per serving? Two tablespoons, 140 calories. Holy geez. Um, not so good for me. So the rider, instead of telling the elephant, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't eat that. The writer goes, well, you worked out today. You didn't eat much yesterday. You're going to be good the rest of the day. It's finding all these justifications for what the elephant wants to do. We're not aware, though, that our elephant is in control. We just think we're the writer, right? We think we're rational and biased and all of these reasons why I should eat the frosting, as opposed to recognizing that my elephant actually suggested that. If I go one step further, um, other people have elephants and riders too. So when we're talking to other people, we're giving them reasons, justifications, usually for what our elephant believes, but they are too. It's really the elephant that's in control. So we need to recognize what our own elephant is up to, but then talk to other people's elephants. They're giving you justifications for what their elephant wants. So we need to recognize how emotional we are um, and biased and listen to others. Um, our groups also tend to reward those whose writers make the best justifications for what their elephants believe. So our tribe has a set of beliefs and let's say that they're completely wrong, right? But within that group, the people whose uh, writers get the best at making good, what appears to be good arguments for the group's beliefs, we reward them, right? We give them status. This is what I meant to say, right? Look at, listen to them. They are making the best argument for this. But it's usually coming from an emotional place. And we're really confident we're right. Um, this is what I call the overconfidence cycle. So motivated reasoning is the, um, the emotional search for justifications for our beliefs, which is literally what I just described. It's what my writer is doing based on an emotional decision, from, uh, uh, belief from my elephant. Confirmation bias is the tendency to find and um, um, 
give more weight to evidence that supports what we already believe. And actually, once we've formed beliefs, we pretty much just see evidence for it everywhere. Uh, this comic here over here does a, a great job um, explaining this. Uh, fun tangent. I, um, my husband and I love to play cards. And there's a card game. I don't like to lose, right? Um, I'm, I try, but I'm not the best loser. And so um, I always think that I lose. And I hate losing. So we start playing the game again. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> here you go. You're going to beat me again, right? Um, but we've been keeping score and keeping tabs. And I have a feeling that's what he's looking up right now. What's the, what is the current? It's something like 70 something to 40 something. Like I win almost all the time, more than I don't. But I don't remember that, right? What I, and the only way I know that is because we're keeping score. If we weren't keeping data, my brain would just keep on believing that I was always losing. And then we get really confident we're right. So uh, Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize for um, his work on biases and heuristics, was asked, if you had a magic wand that could remove the world of one bias, what would it be? And he said, overconfidence. Because if you're really confident you're right, you're not going to change your mind. But notice how we got there through our um, elephant, through illogical ways. And we're more motivated to um, defend beliefs when they're part of who we are. So when they're tied to our identity, um, we don't want to be wrong. The um, threats to a belief literally feel like personal threats. The part of the brain that's activated when there's a personal threat, a, a physical threat, gets activated when you're faced with evidence that you might be wrong. So the more our belief is tied to who we are, the more motivated we are to defend it. And then we add other people and other groups. So um, we often signal our identity in various ways, um, some more than others, but it becomes part of our personal brand. Like uh, somebody who is um, um, you know, wearing t-shirts and um, um, bumper stickers on cars and flags and whatever, all of that's identity signaling. And we, we, that's the extreme form. We do it in all different kinds of ways. But if I've signaled that identity and that belief, then I've even staked a greater claim, uh, uh, need to be right because it's public. It is how I have presented myself. And then when there's another group who believes differently, now we're back to our elephant and rider. Here's the writers that make the best argument and here's why you're wrong. And also, if you don't agree with me, here's my facts. And also then if you don't agree with me, here's why you're stupid or why you're evil. Uh, Brooke Harrington, who's a social psychologist, um, said that um, if there's an E equals MC squared of social psychology, it's that social death is worse than physical death. We will literally rather physically die or be physically harmed than to go against our group. Have you ever noticed how much easier it is to disagree with someone who's not in your tribe than it is to disagree with people in your tribe? It is really hard to go against our group because we risk being ostracized. We don't wanna lose our standing. It's part of who we are. So um, I'm sure you've heard that our uh, facts don't care about your feelings. And that's true, but facts aren't neutral. Um, facts, how we choose facts, how we interpret facts, all of that is coming through this frame of our feelings, our, our elephant. So our feelings also don't care about facts. The top is reasoning. This is what we think we do, right? We think that we've arrived at our beliefs by following evidence to a logical conclusion. But usually what we do is we've arrived here, and this is our personal experiences, it's our socialization, it's what our elephant has suggested to us. And then we use motivated reasoning and confirmation bias to find the evidence and justifications we need to continue to believe what we believe. Basically, we act like lawyers trying to win our case. Right? We're not um, the referee, we're playing on a team, as opposed to standing back and being a referee who's looking at something um, uh, in an unbiased way. 
Okay, back to Dorothy Martin. Uh, so the Seekers were preparing for December 21st. They gave away money. They lost their jobs. Some of them lost their kids. They lost connections with their family. I mean, you wouldn't need that stuff, right? The world's gonna end. They moved in with Dorothy. They were um, getting their sacred books ready, which were Dorothy's prophecies. Uh, the aliens had told them that wearing metal on the flying saucers would disrupt the power field. So they had to make sure that they weren't wearing metal. Uh, but the biggest thing that they needed to do was to believe. Now, the end of the world was December 21st, but they were told that the guardians could come at any moment. So they had to be prepared. So on December 17th, they got a phone call from a uh, captain video from outer space. And uh, the phone call told them uh, that that afternoon, a flying saucer would land in Dorothy's backyard. So they were so excited, right? They ripped off their uh, zippers and they took the underwire out of their bras and they went out and were ready. And I mean, okay, so no aliens. Also, they didn't realize they'd been pranked. Apparently that was a popular television show at the time. And like their end of days cold had kind of picked up steam in the media and they, they were being mocked. By the way, a great way to get somebody to not change their mind is to mock them. As soon as people get mocked for their beliefs, they double down. And if they're being mocked as a collective, then the other people are the ones being mocked. That's my people, right? I need to stick with my people and continue to believe what the group believes. Okay, on December 18th, they got another phone call. The aliens are coming now. They got all ready and the aliens didn't show up. They knew the real date was December 21st. So finally, December 21st arrived and they were here for it, right? So they were in Dorothy's uh, house. Um, again, this is coming through uh, Leon Festinger and his, um, the people he had infiltrate the group. So um, they, were, they were tense, they were silent. I mean, their, their ordeal was finally gonna be over. They were gonna be vindicated and everybody else was going to die in this flood. At midnight, no aliens. Okay, uh, five minutes later, no aliens. Somebody noticed that the clock in the room was wrong. Okay, we're good, we're good, right? Um, five minutes later, so 1210, no aliens. So Dorothy announced, there's been a slight change in plans. There's a bit of a delay, but we're good. Okay, so waiting all through the night. At 2.20 in the morning, still no aliens but she got a message that they should take a coffee break. So they did. Yep. Um, at four o'clock in the morning, they're all sitting in the room, stunned silence. What's gonna happen? No aliens. What do you think happened? Did they change their mind? I mean, no, that's why we're using this as an example. The question is, what kind of justification did they come up with? to save their belief, because that's really what they need, right? They need to find a way to make everything consistent, to, to not have been wrong. And Dorothy got a message, and the message was that their belief had saved the world. There was not going to be a flood because of how they believed and acted. Yeah, not only were they not wrong, they were so right they saved the whole flipping world. Yes. And it's at this point they go out and start proselytizing to people, right? Because look how right we were. We saved the world. You're welcome. So um, this comes from Charles Lawhead, who is the um, oh, professor. He says, I've had to go a long way. I've given up just about everything. I've cut every tie, burned every bridge. I've turned my back on the world. I can't afford to doubt. I have to believe. And there isn't any other truth. Right? He said this to a reporter after when, like, why haven't you changed your mind? Right? Like, I can't. I literally can't. Our motivation to find justification for our beliefs increases when we've been mocked, when um, uh, we have social ties with other people, and we've invested our public reputation. He almost lost his kids in this event, right? He'd given up his money. He lost his job. So he can't afford to doubt. Leon Festinger in When Prophecy Fails wrote, suppose an individual believes something with his whole heart. Suppose further that he has a commitment to this belief, that he's taken irrevocable actions because of it. 
Finally, suppose that he is presented with evidence, unequivocal and undeniable evidence that his belief is wrong. What will happen? The individual will frequently emerge not only unshaken, but even more convinced of the truth of his beliefs than ever before. Indeed, he may even show a new fervor about convincing and converting other people to his beliefs. We don't want to be wrong. So what we do is we find justifications for why we were wrong. So why don't facts change minds? Because it's not about facts. It's not about facts. Now, I'm showing two people here having an argument over what superficially appears to be facts. And they're talking past each other because it's not about the facts. Underneath that, there are these elephants with their emotions, their biases, their identity needs. And they're using their writer to find these justifications and presenting them as this is why. But that's not why, right? And that's equally why it's not um, a winning strategy to use facts to counter that, because it's not about facts. There are four people in this conversation. One extra thing, so at the beginning we talked about the different kinds of beliefs, falsifiable and not falsifiable. We can make falsifiable beliefs unfalsifiable by refusing to accept the evidence. We find justifications, we make excuses. Conspiracy theorists are masters at this, right? Why doesn't the evidence support the conspiracy? Well, it was hidden. Or why does this evidence disprove the conspiracy? Well, it was planted, obviously, right? There's always a reason, there's an excuse. And that's what happens when we're really motivated by our elephant. But here's the thing, if you wanna change somebody else's mind, you have to be willing to change yours too. Um, I often ask people, what have you changed your mind about? And it, it's a, a really interesting question. I really struggle with it. There's something called change belief blindness, which is we change our mind actually quite frequently. We just don't realize it. We always edit previous events to update with what we currently know and to see ourselves in a positive light. So we don't tend to realize it. This is a great way to test your beliefs and then we can use it to have conversations with others. But um, when evaluating your beliefs, first start with um, how sure are you? Literally put a confidence scale on it, zero to 100%, but avoid zero and 100, right? Be in the middle someplace and be willing to move. Where did it come from? So that would be like literally drilling down. I heard this someplace or I had this experience that gave it to me. Now your reasons, those are probably the things that your elephant has come up with, which is totally fine. But then how would you figure out if it's true? This is where you try to test it. And you can't test unfalsifiable beliefs, which is where you start to notice, well, you know what? I think kittens are cuter than puppies, but I can't actually prove that wrong. Okay, that's unfalsifiable. How would I feel if I was wrong? This is where you start to notice if you have a strong like identity or emotional attachment to a belief, notice that feeling and um, try to figure out if the belief is actually a, an emotional belief. And then what would change your mind? So if you can't think of anything that would change your mind, that's really a problem. You should always be willing to change your mind. I tend to start um, with less triggering beliefs. So things that aren't as important. So for example, um, what is the capital of Australia? So you're not supposed to know that. <laughs> Most people say Sydney, right? Okay, great. Why do you think it's Sydney? Well, we could talk about this. But the point is, um, how would you feel if you were wrong about the capital of Sydney? And most people are like, mm, I don't care, <laughs> right? It's not important. Um, okay, Canberra, oh, okay, I'll change my mind. That's fine, right? Okay, that's not as important, but then practice. Like work the muscle, get, get, um, um, learn to practice how to evaluate beliefs and move more and more into things that might be more triggering. Now, in a conversation with somebody else, one of the first questions to ask yourself is, why do I want to change their mind? Right? Do you have a, a purpose in doing this? And what is that purpose? Like, is this somebody that you really care about? Um, is this a particularly harmful belief? But whatever it is, um, why do you want to? And then that first question turns out to be really important. So practice this with somebody else. Okay, so how sure are you that that belief is true? Have them put a value on it. Um, and let's say that they say 90%. Okay, well, why aren't you 100? 
the question isn't like, here's why that that's wrong and here's why you should move it. It's you're not 100%, why not? And then their writer starts to find their own reasons why they might be wrong. You can't change someone else's mind. They have to change their own. And you also can't download your reasoning into somebody else's brain. They have to do that for themselves. And so this is the practice of getting them to think through their reasons, to question their own beliefs. And importantly, don't talk to their writer. Talk to their elephant. What's pro especially if this is a really important belief, maybe one that's triggering, there is an underlying motivation. There's a, um, uh, an emotional reason, there's an identity need, there's a value. Dig down to that. And my guess is there's some place to connect. We tend to have a lot in common, especially if you dig down to that. Drill down to the unfalsifiable part, the, the core beliefs, and then find common ground. Empathize with people. They may be experiencing world differently than you. Like, be curious about that and help them reason and be a partner in the process. So the take home, use your writer to think critically, not just to justify the elephant. And it's not about facts. Uh, I, this is from my website here, it's basic um, critical thinking. Some of the things that are important, more important I suppose on there, are um, things like separating your identity from your beliefs. It literally, um, I try to imagine um, taking my belief outside of myself. It is really hard to be objective about a belief when it is how we see ourselves, right? So separate it. Be okay with being wrong. Um, Daniel Kahneman again said that um, he's happy when he's wrong. When somebody has shown him to be wrong, it's like, it, there's joy in that. Why? Because I learned something. I am now less wrong than I was before. But seriously, think about that. Like, how happy are you to be wrong? Right? It's not a fun experience generally. But change that. Make it fun to be wrong. Uh, and the humbleness, learn, you might be wrong. Avoid overconfidence and be willing to change your mind. Basically, if the aliens don't come for you, what will you do? right? Will you change your mind? And that's where we want to be. So if you have any questions or want to um, follow me on Twitter or Facebook and my website, but thank you very much for your time. Well done. Thank you. All right. I will walk on for one second. Thank you so much, okay. Melanie. No, you can stay, oh, please. I Who has stay. a question? Does anyone have a question? Yes, Scott. The people that infiltrated, did, were there any writings about how hard they found it to infiltrate that group and what effect did that have on them? Oh, what effect? Um, so when Prophecy Fails, the, the book that uh, Fessinger ended up writing, does talk about their experiences. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know what a long-term effect that it had. Um, personally, I kind of wonder, um, like today, what our... Um, how ethical is, is it to do that? I don't know, but um, yeah, they, I don't know actually. I've not heard anything bad about their experiences. Yeah, okay, sorry, I wish I could answer that better. Anyone else? I thought I saw people writing questions down, nothing? All right, I have a question. Oh, yes, please. So the survey of if you'd rather be dead or socially embarrassed, when you take that survey, how many dead people did he talk to? Uh, um, okay, that was just a Okay. <laughs> Blink if you disagree. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can get this straight, though. You're a scientist, a biology teacher, and you, you're a scientist that teaches. I'll try not to screw this up, but I think the National Teachers Science Association, their, their first heading in the statement on nature of science is that science is both reliable, yet tentative and subject to change at the same time. I have two questions about that. And the first is, that can get thrown back at you as a reason not to believe anything. All right? Uh, so I wonder what your response to that is. And then the other thing is, how do we know if we're in a reliable phase or one that is going to change? And specifically, I think here, leaded gas of the 70s. You're too young for that, probably. But leaded gas was put, I'm sorry, lead was put into gasoline to keep engines from knocking and pinging, I think. But then it turned out that was a horrible idea. idea. So not reliable. What, do you have an answer to those two questions? Uh, yeah, and, and they are related. So, um, 
Yeah, the tentative nature of science. Um, if we think about that zero to 100 um, in terms of um, how confident we are, in scientific questions, um, the more evidence that we get and from the more different lines of evidence, our um, uh, confidence increases. But we never get to 100% certainty. And uh, that would be the tentative nature of science in that we can change our mind with evidence. And that's a good thing. Not all conclusions are equally tentative though, right? Some are very tentative and some are much more supported. Like some of the, the big theories like um, evolutionary theory, um, um, anthropogenic climate change uh, are so well supported that they're very unlikely to change. But if I wanted to deny those conclusions, and that denial usually comes from, um, again, identity issues, emotions. Uh, in the case of um, evolution, it would be something like um, a perceived uh, conflict with religious views. Uh, and something like climate change or leaded gas, um, it might be because of um, uh, not liking government regulations. And actually industry funded denial uh, that started like tobacco strategy and moved through leaded gas and onto fossil fuels, um, that was all basically motivated by um, not wanting the government to regulate something. And so, um, if you want to deny science, one of the best things, um, one of the most effective strategies is the use of impossible expectations. Basically, you're not 100% certain, are you? No? See? We don't know. We don't know enough to regulate. So denial strategies tend to focus on that little bit of we could be wrong uh, to try and throw out everything else that we know, which I think is why it's important for science education to teach this idea of um, science not as a process of 100% certainty, but reducing uncertainty as it goes. Um, leaded gas and uh, climate change and so on, all of those denials were motivated by um, uh, industry that didn't want regulation. And so um, the, um, the strategies they used were to play on people's identity issues, to play, uh, to make it tribal, to make it um, uh, ideological, uh, and to um, try to convince people that the science didn't know enough to regulate their products. I feel like I missed part of your question. No, I think that's it. Okay, okay. My question, it sort of builds on Brian's, which is, so when leaded gas was introduced, it did indeed reduce knocking and pinging, and it was just that over time people realized, well, it has this side effect on people's health. So I think one of the things with science is that you can come out with the, and not just science, but in specifically introducing products or using science in our day-to-day -day life, is that um, impacts emerge over time. It wasn't that leaded gas was introduced and everyone said it's perfectly safe for your health and you're, there's never going to be a problem with it. It was just, hey, it solves this problem. And then it goes into widespread use and then the problems emerge later. And as you said, then these entrenched interests say, well, I don't want to give it up because I make money from this or whatever. It, it seems just to be that there's this ongoing battle between, hey, the views of scientists have changed because there's new information, but then there's all these people who make money or for whatever reason don't want to suddenly say, well, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, and it does seem like you're, it goes to the heart of this issue about, you know, people have their beliefs and then they try to convince people with their reasons that may or may not be based in objective facts, but they sound like good reasons or whatever. So how do you see, you know, and maybe there's no answer to this, but how do you try to have that discussion, and the, a lot of these are public discussions, you know, with politicians or people from industry, but are there any groups that try to, I guess, mediate these kind of disputes? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, great question. Um, the first thing, uh, as far as groups that help do this, uh, the Mental Immunity Project that I'm part of, um, we are trying to do that. There is um, Street Epistemology with Agni, uh, Anthony Magnabosco, and it's, it's a wonderful um, project that uses um, basically Socratic questioning, like the, um, the testing your beliefs graphic I had up here. They do a lot of those things, and they actually video conversations uh, on uh, showing how the process works. Um, 
so let me back up for a second. The, um, a lot of the confusion over what science actually knows comes from industry purposefully confusing. So like if we were to say, um, a lot of people like to point out how scientific consensuses have changed over time. And they have, um, but they don't tend to happen the way that um, a lot of people think they do in like a single scientist going, Eureka, aha, everything we know is wrong. Uh, and the stronger consensus, the less likely it is to change. So um, the denial strategies, they don't necessarily try to point out, um, here is why you're wrong. They flood the zone with misinformation. So um, I don't need to convince you that the science doesn't know. I just need to instill enough doubt in you that we don't know enough and then throw out enough confusing information out there that you just kind of go, I don't know, what do I believe? I'll just believe what people trust, uh, believe. Um, but something like um, climate change is, it, if you're having a conversation with somebody about climate change and um, they, they, let's say that um, I think climate change is real and somebody else does not. Um, climate change, as far as the science goes, is about as settled as science is going to get. So let's jump from that place. Somebody who doesn't believe that is likely been a victim of misinformation. And that misinformation came from uh, industry trying to sow doubt and to confuse people based on ideological issues and making it, um, making it an identity thing. So if somebody is having a conversation over this, I'm not going to change their mind by giving them all the science or even by convincing them why the science is right. The better strategy would be to drill down to where that denial comes from. And then nobody likes to be fooled. And so connecting on, on um, you know, like you care about your kids, you care about your grandkids and their future. Um, uh, you know, we all think that we have a, a responsibility to do the right thing. Okay, great. So let's connect over that. And now, um, you know, that information um, that you're using that actually came from a strategy to try to convince you of something that isn't true. They're, they're lying to you. Um, so making it more of a, a personal issue. And again, I started rambling and I'm not sure I answered your question or not. Well, I'm not sure there's an answer to it. And it was sort of sure. because there are these public debates and you know, there's generally two convincing sounding people and there's no m public mediator or anything like that. And, and frankly, the strategies that people use to try to confuse the issue, that's science, right? It's, here's how psychology works, so here's what I'll do, you know, and, but it's just so it's a, but the sad thing is there's real impacts that the eight billion people that live in the world are affected by because of these debates and then. Yeah, and actually one of the things that, um, like the, the news is getting a little bit better, but this idea of having like, two different sides on a debate, you know, like having um, a climate scientist come in and represent the scientific consensus and then having like a, a politician or um, maybe somebody who works for a conservative think tank come in and um, I'm not making the situation up by the way. And so then it looks like, well, you can either believe this or you can believe this, whoever makes the better argument. Um, and it, it's really disingenuous. So um, the, the personal conversations are a better way to go. It is a lot harder to do, um, but there's so much misinformation online and it's so easy to retreat into, this is what I already believe, um, and this is what my group believes, and I don't wanna lose my group, that, um, that yeah, it's, it's a hard problem. I wish I had a simpler answer. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Sure. Okay, everyone. Thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you for being here all. I hope you enjoyed it and you appreciate Melanie's thoughts on this. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Melanie Tresick King of Thinking is Power. Definitely check out her website. There are a lot of resources there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It was an honor.